Take a network break. I'm Drew Conry Murray. And I'm Jonna Johnson. Help yourself to a virtual donut and join us for an analysis of this week's tech news. We're going to talk about new capabilities from Juniper and Ariaka, some Cisco investment moves, the FTC forcing InfoSec on a breach offender, and more. Our sponsor today is the AutoCon Conference. You can join the pack of pushers and 400 fellow network nerds at AutoCon 2 this November. AutoCon is an independent conference dedicated to advancing the state of the art of network automation. Learning opportunities abound from hands on workshops to presentations from network engineers to automation in the wild to the fabled hallway track where you get the real deal from engineers in the trenches. Registration is open now. Spots are running out. Go to networkautomation.forum slash autocon2. That's networkautomation.forum slash autocon2 for the agenda and registration details. We hope to see you November 18th through the 22nd in Denver. Colorado. Uh, John, before we hit the news, we got a couple of FUs, some follow-ups, and uh, please carry us on. Absolutely. So first we got one, a follow-up about Network Break. While I do understand that building telco at massive scale is anything but easy, the same company with the CEO and wrenches just did a massive layoff. You know, we get rid of ops, so of course the network suffers. And oh, by the way, as far as Fred Brooks, did you read the book? He's referring to the Mythical Man Month. Or did you buy five books to read it in one-fifth the time? And my response is five books in half the time because we all know that works, right? <laughs> and yes, I have to agree. Excellent point that telcos are not always sane about the, how they manage companies. No further, no objection here. You are correct. <laughs> Uh, and then someone else wrote, uh, I guess he was a little disgruntled. He said the Elon hate could not be more obvious, praising the federal government for 40 Starlinks distributed while ignoring the, the, the hundreds that SpaceX has deployed in the disaster areas. Uh, no Elon hate here. We're just reporting what we see. And in fact, before we got this, we actually had already selected a uh, SpaceX note for this episode of Network Break. This listener goes on to write, perhaps revisiting the discussions about the revocation of the FCC Rural Digital Opportunity Fund award is in order. What a difference it would have made if these assets were already in place in some of the these rural areas. Uh, it's, it would seem that if there was a problem with the metrics the government cited for its decision, et cetera, et cetera, and goes on to provide some, you know, personal notes and personal experience. Uh -huh. Definitely agree we need to go back and have a look at that because it is very important to understand what, what the FCC is doing and what the logical implication is going to be for these kinds of things. So thank you for the tip. Uh, totally agree with revisiting those discussions. And uh, yeah, thanks much for writing in. Please do follow up with us. Yeah, packetpushers.net slash FU. Uh, we do read everything that comes in. So if you got a question, a comment, a correction, whatever, we're always happy to take a look. All right, let's dive into the news. First, Juniper Networks is bringing its SD-WAN and security products under its MIST AI umbrella. The company announced a new capability in which you can deploy SRX firewalls and SSR SD-WAN gateways with pre-configured network and security policies to help you speed up deployments. You can also now get visibility into security actions taken by these devices in a new security assurance service, which falls under that MIST AI umbrella. Um, John, I feel like these mm, capabilities aren't really that big a deal. I think the bigger picture here is that Juniper is taking steps to move its full portfolio under the MIST AI umbrella. Juniper saying that down the road, it will enable its AI to make policy and security recommendations and eventually take automated security actions. We're not there yet, but the first step is to start getting these products under that MIST umbrella. Yeah, no, I completely agree. And, uh, you know, as as this kind of indicates, vendors are using AI to kind of swing the pendulum away from best of breed and back towards you'll get the best results if you use as much of our portfolio as we can sell you. Keeping in mind the fact that Juniper is in the process of getting purchased by HPE, right. which points into a very intriguing direction for all of this. I would say in general, uh, Juniper's not wrong. We have actually done the research many years ago. We did network operations research to see exactly what the benefit was of using all the same gear. The problem is when we did the research, what we wanted to do was compare uh, the cost of operating a heterogeneous network with oper operating a homogeneous network. And mm -hmm. guess what? We couldn't find a single example of a homogeneous network. <laughs> so, <laughs> so we right. sort of were had to fall back on, yeah. OK, if you're sort of more than X percent homogeneous, do, is there a benefit? And the truth is there is a TCO benefit. The question I would ask, and it's the question we ask often over in the podcast heavy strategy is – to what extent are you paying for that lower total cost of ownership by getting vendor lock-in? And that's a strategic decision because ultimately what the vendor can then do is jack up the prices knowing that you can't afford to leave because you've got – you've made this heavy-duty commitment. Yeah. Juniper hasn't done that yet. I know they would love to be in the position to do that. We know other vendors in the space do do that. So uh, I guess I would say watch this space. And uh, I think, Drew, you had some comments about how 
other vendors are kind of following the same roadmap as Juniper here. Yeah, so Arista recently made an announcement essentially saying with its Cloud Vision uh, management platform and its EOS uh, software, it's essentially going after the same strategy. Use Arista in your data center, in your campus, in your WAN uh, to get those operational benefits. And eventually they'll, I'm sure, add some AI on top of it. Fortinet's doing the same thing. Uh, it's got firewalls, it's got switches, it's got APs, and it's got an AI, and it's trying to get you into that platform. And the argument is, you know, our telemetry, our data models, our data structures in our data lake makes it easy for our, our AI to find the right insights and actions to give you sound recommendations and help your operations. And, you know, I, I do think there's something to that. But again, it's the question of one, who actually has a homogenous network? Nobody. Uh, and two, there are also efforts going on in the space by, you know, startups and, and out of the companies to provide sort of an AI overlay on whatever it is you're using. Uh, so I think companies are going to have to be keeping an eye on this space to decide which strategy is best for them. Yeah, and I think the, the operative word here is strategy because uh, what you want to do is when you're assessing network infrastructure components is know whether you're following a best in breed uh, an ecosystem strategy. Ecosystem strategy says that you buy products from different vendors, but you make sure they integrate really nicely. Or if you're really going for the big rock strategy, which is everything from one vendor. All of them have pros and cons. What we found through research is that the ecosystem approach usually is the best, but it's also the hardest to follow because it requires a lot of time and attention during the procurement process, which is hard for working engineers to pull their pull their minds away from their day-to-day -day jobs and focus on this procurement exercise. Yeah. Um, and in the following the broad theme of consolidation, Ariaka is stepping up its native SASE capabilities. Ariaka is a network as a service provider and has expanded its SASE service to include a native CASB fully integrated into the service. It's also added an interactive product experience, IPX, service that allows customers to perform non-production network testing of SASE devices. IPX creates a virtual network that customers can use to test the effects of different SASE services and settings on flows between network locations they care about. Uh, Ariaka has also partnered with Menlo Security to offer a remote browser isolation service under its SASE umbrella. I think this is part of a broader theme in which the network as a service providers are beginning to layer on a lot of security capabilities and expanding their existing security capabilities to become all in one network and security as a service providers. Yes. And, you know, Drew, I don't know if you've got particular thoughts on that. I mean, I, I, it's smart for Ariaka because it's playing in the SASE space to add CASB. And frankly, CASB is one of those table stakes features of, of Secure Access Service Edge. So I'm surprised it kind of took them this long because they've been an early entrant in this space, but it's there now. So it's, you can check that box. I think that's good. Um, I, the, the, what I thought most interesting was they're partnering with Menlo Security on the remote browser um, isolation. That, that's an interesting concept. Um, the Menlo service essentially is, executes web content uh, in an isolated environment in their cloud rather than having content run on your browser like a JavaScript that happens to have malware in it. The goal is to prevent malicious executables from being run on the user's endpoint. It's a great idea. I do think, though, one potential hang-up here is that your web session has to go from the Ariaka pop out to the Menlo cloud, run in the isolation, and then now follow that path back to the endpoint. So latency may be an issue here. Again, it's a question of risk versus performance. So if you're interested, it's there for you to play with. And also that IPX thing, It's I talked to Ariaka about this. They said it's it's hard to test SASE, so they wanted to make it easy as possible to give customers an opportunity to play with it. And that's what the IPX thing is about. Yeah, and I think that one is actually particularly interesting, speaking as somebody who accidentally crashed the production network uh, a long time ago in a galaxy far, <laughs> far away doing testing on it. Um, don't do that. Uh, I, I also have to smile with the whole, you know, the, the Menlo scenario because that's – isn't that right back to terminal server from the old days? <laughs> and actually what flashed in my mind was that was actually how Cisco got on – uh, not Cisco, Citrix got on the map. Right. Because they were right. basically offering terminal server access to Excel, which I thought was like the most genius thing in the world – as I'm typing on my Google Sheets here. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> but uh, but yes, as you say, latency can be a huge issue for websites because, you know, even a fraction of a second makes a difference to users. So definitely, if you're planning to use it, uh, do test that out and test it in multiple scenarios with multiple endpoints because latency may vary by endpoint. Yeah, and maybe be very selective in whatever sessions it is you're going to send for remote browser isolation. I, I really like the idea. And of course, you know, ransomware and stuff, one of the ways it gets in through is the browser, so I can see why folks would be interested in this, but we also know that when performance suffers, end users complain and find workarounds, so uh, it's always the trade-off. 
Uh, moving on, the U.S. Federal Trade Commission has worked out a settlement with the Marriott Hotel chain and its Starwood subsidiary in which the company has to pay $52 million for a string of data breaches over a six-year period that affected more than 344 million customers. Uh, $52 million, sure, okay. Uh, I think the thing that was most interesting to me about this announcement is that the FTC is also ordering the company to implement a comprehensive InfoSec program. That InfoSec program includes writing and maintaining an incident response plan, logging and monitoring IT assets, viewing logs every 24 hours. They have to implement multi-factor authentication. They have to have data access controls for employees and partners. They have to harden their OSs. There's a ton more. This plan has to be certified for the next 20 years and must also undergo third-party assessments every two years. Uh, so there's one part of me going, yes, yes, get them, FTC, get them. And then there's another part of me going, ah, is this really going to work? Jonna? Yeah, well, um, I've just got to say, I just went and checked uh, Marriott's stock price, and it has been mon monotonically increasing, well, almost monotonically increasing, depending on how you smooth, uh, for the past month. And it had a big jump up following the FTC announcement. So anytime that happens, I'm going to say that basically the market said, ha ha, slap on the wrist. And quite frankly, as I was reading all the things that uh, that Marriott is required to do, first of all, they're completely normal and they should have right. been doing them all along. So <laughs> there is that. I mean, multi-factor authentication. Come on, people. Really? Yeah. Um, <laughs> logging <and> your assets. <laughs> right. it, well, actually, in fairness, logging and monitoring IT assets is an unsolved problem for the vast majority of companies because there are no decent asset automated asset mo management tools. And more broadly, um, in a large environment, it's so dynamic that you, you know, the idea that you walk around with a clipboard and a spreadsheet is obsolete. So Absolutely. that's a much bigger problem, I will say. Reviewing logs, I think that's kind of straightforward. Data access controls, hardening, hardening operating systems, really people. <laughs> um, but net net, it really looks like, you know, Marriott dodged the bullet. Yay, $52 million, that's pocket change for them. Um, and, oh, grow up and implement a grown-up cybersecurity program. You know, it looks like, I, I you know, it's, yeah, I, it's a I, I, yeah. do, I don't have a lot of quibbles with what the FTC is recommending, but my worry is that I presume Marriott was also under PCI DSS requirements, mm -hmm. which have pretty much the same things in it. And they still had a bunch of breaches yep. over six years and that didn't seem to do anything. So these sort of mandated cybersecurity programs, however good they sound on paper, just just tend not to work. So yes, I'm I'm reminded of a of a rather famous politician who I'm not going to name because this isn't about politics. Who mentioned that many years ago, before he got into politics, uh, essentially every time he got slapped with a fine, his strategy was to ignore it, and then they double the fine and triple the fine, and eventually the fines would go away, and he was done. Uh, I'm not saying that Marriott will ignore it because they're not that kind of company, but I'm quite confident that they will get all the boxes checked on paper. Whether or not that will result in a, an immeasurable secur security stance improvement is highly questionable. Yeah. I guess the other thing I want to say about this is, and I feel kind of weird coming to Marriott's defense, but they're in the hotel business. They're not in the cybersec business. Uh, and I feel like the broader issue here is that IT companies, IT vendors have failed in their duty of care to their customers because they're providing products that don't integrate well, that can be often riddled with bugs and vulnerabilities. They're hard to integrate with other layers of the stack. That's not really Marriott's problem, right? Marriott should be able to run its business without also having to run essentially an IT consultancy on the side or a security consultancy on the side. Yes, they have a duty of care to their customers to do some basic protections, and it sounds like they weren't. But we are also operating – like if cars were built the way that IT products are built or airplanes, <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> we wouldn't drive and we wouldn't fly. So why does IT get a pass? Why do IT vendors get a pass with just crap quality? Well, and that is a much bigger question and that's something – you know, the real question here is – at what point do you get to turn around to the vendors and say, listen, you are selling me crap. You are selling me crap that introduces vulnerabilities. Go fix it. We all know which vendors Jana considers top of the heap of <laughs> this kind of egregious content, conduct. And guess what? They are some of the biggest companies on the planet. Right. So, uh, yes, I agree that this is not necessarily Marriott's fault. That said – the current environment is what it is. Anyone listening to this who has a cybersecurity program is going, well, we have to do it. Why shouldn't you? Absolutely. So, you know, another way to look at this is that Marriott probably made a ton more money by ignoring basic cybersecurity processes and investing that time and energy into something else. And it doesn't seem that they're getting punished for that at all. Yeah. So, you know, that's that's the real problem. And, you know, again, I will 
I will, as I said, I'm channeling my inner Greg here. But when you look at the stock prices, they actually got rewarded for getting spanked by the FTC. And I think this is the market's way of saying, phew, dodged a bullet. Could be. Yeah. Uh, Anyway. All right. A quick break to remind you that the AutoCon 2 conference takes place November 18th through the 22nd in Denver, Colorado. The Packet Pushers are media partners, and we'd love to see you there. AutoCon is an independent conference. It's dedicated to advancing the state of the art of network automation. It's the place to learn more about the practice of network automation, orchestration, observability, AI tooling, education, processes and standards, and more. So you can come and hear what your peers are doing in their networks, what solution providers are bringing to the table, and what's happening with open source and all things network automation. Go to networkautomation.forum slash autocon2 for details and registration. That's networkautomation.forum slash autocon2, and we will hope to see you in Denver again November 18th through the 22nd. And I just want to add to that, you can tell this is a real conference by geeks for geeks because the original conference is Network Automation Zero. That's right. (laughs) This is the third one, so it's AutoCon 2, yes. Of course, of course. And we all think that makes perfect sense, but there you go. Um, Well, moving on, Cisco is now exiting its investment in Rubrik and eyeing GPU cloud CoreWeave. CoreWeave is an NVIDIA-partnered cloud platform that focuses on GPU-based services for AI, and Cisco is said to have valued it at $23 billion, with Mm -hmm. a B, according to Reuters, and intends to invest in it. We don't know the size of the terms of the investment, but they're certainly eyeing it is a fair way to put it. Neither company, neither CoreWeave nor Cisco has confirmed the story, but this is what Reuters is telling us. At the other end of the investment life cycle, Cisco has sold off its shares in Rubrik, which is, you may remember, a data security company it invested in back when Rubrik bought Dados IO, a startup that Cisco had put money into. Rubrik went public in April. Cisco showed, sold its shares valued at close to $6 million at the time, which is not really... You know, again, pocket change for Cisco, far yeah. too little, little to manner, yeah. matter. But what's interesting is that Cisco's kind of said data security, yesterday's news, uh, AI, GPU-based services for AI, tomorrow's news, which is kind of interesting to think about. I mean, and frankly, I'm not surprised to see Cisco, if it's true, actually looking at CoreWeave. And my understanding is CoreWeave essentially builds GPU-based services that you can rent, sort of like uh, mm-hmm. IaaS, but for AI services, I guess. Uh, hot market, uh, not surprised Cisco wants to be there. Uh, anything with AI in it, uh, all of the big vendors are getting behind, so not surprised Cisco's going here. I am surprised to see them step out of Rubric. Uh, that seems like a product that actually works. Uh, and in the ransomware era, having good data backup and data protection seems like a, a, a no-brainer, but uh, you know, Cisco, I guess, knows what it's doing, so... Well, I mean, I think it's... I think we've got the innovator's dilemma here. You know, the the big... The fundamental problem with the innovator's dilemma is that super innovative, effective developments are often not are not uh, financially credible inside large companies because, you know, if you're talking about a couple dollars here and a couple dollars there, a couple million here and there, the large company literally cannot put the resources towards it that it really needs to grow because it just doesn't rise to the to the priority level of mm-hmm. you know investments with billions of dollars in mm-hmm. it. So that's the fundamental challenge, and that's why there is a market for startups and and innovators that are very small. Yeah, and I assume Cisco also thinks if it decides Rubrik is actually something it wants to be part of, it can just go buy it now that it's public. (laughs) Yeah, exactly, if it needs to. (laughs) Uh, Moving on, security researchers are warning of stealthy Linux server malware. It's been in operation since at least 2021. The malware exploits a known vulnerability in Apache Rocket MQ. This is CVE 2023-33246, which has had a severity rating of 10 out of 10. Uh, It's also taking advantage of thousands of misconfigurations to access these servers. The researchers say the malware, which is called Perf CTL, is often used to run a crypto miner or to serve as a traffic relay, and it uses numerous techniques to escape detection and persist on infected machines. Uh, We've got a link uh, to the original research uh, in the show notes that uh, can tell you indicators of compromise and offer offer suggestions for mitigation, including patching the vulnerabilities associated with the malware. So if you are running Linux, this may be something you want to take a look at. Yep. And there's not really much more to add on this other than pay attention. You know, if if there's a possibility that you're compromised, do something about it right now. It's kind of not hard to say. Moving on in the, the general theme of regulation, as most folks know at this point, Governor Gavin Newsom re- vetoed SB 1047 last month. 1047 was the big AI bill that basically put massive regulation around AI models and had all sorts of constraints on how they could be used and what people could do with them. What's interesting is that that bill was actually backed by an overwhelming majority of the California Assembly. Uh, something like 80 percent had voted for it, which means that they can override this veto should they wish. Mm. 
However, uh, Newsom had a number of choices. He could have signed it. He could have just kicked it back with no comment or he could have done what he did, which is make a bunch of comments. And his comments are essentially that the bill is well-intentioned but doesn't take into account specific circumstances in which AI might be deployed. And more importantly, it focuses very heavily on the big models without looking at Uh, You know, looking at some of the smaller emerging, you know, we're talking now about small language models that are coming out, and this gives them almost a hall pass. As he put it, by focusing only on the most expensive and large scale models, SB 1047 establishes a regulatory framework that could give the public a false sense of security about controlling this fast moving technology, he said. Uh, Smaller, more specialized models may emerge as equally or even more dangerous than the models targeted by SB 1047. At the potential expense of curtailing the very innovation that fuels advancement in favor of the public good. I think he's correct on that. And one of the challenges with everything I've seen so far to uh, to regulate, uh, to broadly regulate AI, operative word being broadly, fall, has this problem. You're essentially trying to say some AI is good, some AI is bad without looking at how it's going to be used, just uh-huh. just external factors like the size of the model or who delivers it. Um, in fact, I still remember last year the um, President Biden signed the executive order that set, was talking on and on about AI as an IaaS. And I'm looking at this going, well, you just let chat GPT and open AI off the hook because they're sad, <laughs> you know. So bro- I think it's much harder to regulate well for something as broad and dynamic as AI. What Newsom did sign was a lot of very specific targeted bills that say things like you are not allowed to create child, child porn with AI. You, we will treat you as if you had created real child child porn. So don't use AI to create child porn. Don't use, you know, all these other things. And whoops, I think we just broke the uh, G rating for the (laughs) (laughs) show. But those kinds of things, I think, very important to understand that if you are regulating the output and a specific use case, you're going to have much better luck than sort of broadly saying we're going to regulate, regulate AI based on the models. It's also worth understanding that anytime regulation is passed, it tends to benefit the incumbents who've already gotten there and hurt the folks that are the true innovators. And I think Newsom's comments indicate that he's aware of that. And those are my thoughts. Drew, did you have anything to add? I didn't look at SB 1047, the particulars of the bill. So I don't want to 100 percent dive into this too much. But I I will say my take is we need to be focused more on the outcomes of the AI. That's where the problems are. So if it's systems, like you said, that are producing, you know, uh, deep fakes that are untrue or, you know, uh, content that harms the community in some way or that finds a way to discriminate against people or is just wrong. Uh, that you want to focus on outcomes, not necessarily about the models or who's running them or that kind of thing. I think, especially at this point, uh, my, the, the cynical take is that I'm sure you know, being the governor of California, Gavin Newsom gets a lot of donations from big tech companies, and they may have you know backed up the dump truck of donation money to him, being like, "Can you squash this?" Uh, so Actually, it, it, it doesn't hurt of... his position in the in the in the state to to be against regulating AI out of the gate. Actually, it's been kind of weird because the big tech companies generally, the ones that are deeply involved in AI, kind of like it because it protects them because they're the incumbents. Mm. So it's been kind of weird. Like this is not the sort of thing that splits people the way you would think. Um, It's essentially anybody that wants into the business wants wanted the bill not signed, and anyone that um, was already there was kind of like, yeah, that's good, go go with it. You know, regulate my competitors. Yeah, I I guess whenever a tech company is like, yes, I'm fine with this regulation, then like it, then it's not good enough. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. (laughs) exactly. Something's wrong here. Something's missing. (laughs) And I will furthermore. So I agree with you 100. percent I will also add the comment that um, again, this is a veto proof. Uh, percentage of the assembly. So if the assembly wishes, it can. It has another, uh, I want to say 60 business days or 60 working days to go ahead and resubmit the bill and override the veto. My guess is they aren't going to do that because Newsom provided some very real objections that really ought to be addressed. And mm-hmm. I think everybody can see that by making it public. But there's nothing stopping them introducing a bill that's sort of tweaked according to what his concerns are, maybe early next year or thereabouts. So basically, the moral of the story here is watch the space. There's a lot of regulation going on outside the U.S. and within other states in the U.S. So the AI regulation space is going to be a very interesting space for the foreseeable future. Yeah, I also can see just from a political standpoint, it's very easy for, you know, a state senator or some other politician to, to be like, AI can be dangerous. I voted to regulate AI. And that's that's as far as they exactly. need to go for most people who will be like, yep, sounds good. Didn't, didn't read exactly. the details. They cast, 
they cast their vote, they're done. They don't need to actually go do the hard work of retooling the bull, the, the bill to make it look, you know, mo, mo, align more with what Newsom says. So it's entirely possible that this whole thing just sort of goes away, yeah. um, which is kind of interesting. It's, it was, it's been an interesting lesson in how democracy works because when we were looking at this, we were saying, well, wait a minute. Everybody's asking the question, well, will Newsom veto the bill? Like, why does that matter? It's a veto-proof majority. But once you game it out, you realize there's a there's a non-zero probability that the whole thing just goes away, even though there was a majority for the reasons you just mentioned, Drew. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, maybe they can actually go back to work on a bill that actually does. I I think, as you mentioned, we want to focus on outcomes. Maybe they can think about that uh, as a way to approach AI regulation. Yeah, I mean, Newsom actually provided a really clear roadmap towards a bill that he could sign. So if they're willing to if they actually care and aren't just doing performative politics, Mm -hmm. um, they can they certainly can rewrite the bill in a way that uh, Newsom could sign it. So we'll see. We'll see what happens. I mean, they can also just push it through as is just to get that to get it there. But I don't think they will. That's speculation on my part. And you'll hear back from us on this topic uh, whenever it becomes relevant again. All right. Um, Moving right along, the FCC lets Starlink activate direct-to-sell coverage in the wake of Helene. The FCC decided on October 6th to allow SpaceX Starlink Network to activate its direct-to-sell space-based cell services in parts of North Carolina. Emergency temporary services approvals are not unusual after major disasters. And as a reader pointed out, SpaceX has, in fact, been stepping up to try to deliver these. Uh, at the same time, you know, 17 percent of cell towers in the disaster area are still out of service. SpaceX confirmed that the satellites were sending emergency alerts soon after and T-Mobile users would soon see some texting capabilities. Um, The satellite system does not yet support voice traffic, although to be perfectly honest, I'm not sure that will ever become a requirement again, given the way society has changed to to text. I don't know. Um, But in any event, here's an example of uh, uh, SpaceX stepping up, the FCC signing off on it, and we're off to the races in, you know, in helping a disaster hit areas. Yeah, my I thought this deal, we, I think we may have covered this earlier that T-Mobile and, and Starlink slash SpaceX uh, signed a deal where you could use your just bog standard T-Mobile phone mm-hmm. to connect to an actual satellite uh, to, to send or receive text or I don't know if they're doing voice, it sounds like not. Um, and I, I anticipate more folks are going to be doing this. Apple also released uh, direct to satellite capabilities, I think last year or two years ago. So we know mobile device makers are building in this capability. And we also know that uh, the skies are being full, filled with communication satellites uh, by multiple companies. So glad to see this happening, particularly it's super useful in a disaster context. Um, so yeah, the, the space networking proceeds at pace. Exactly, exactly. All right, that wraps up uh, the news portion. We don't have a tech bite. So Jana, if folks want to find you online, where should they go? You can always hit me up on LinkedIn. I've met several several of you there or come to the company website, which is nomertes.com, N like Nancy, E-M like Mary, E-R-T like Thomas, E-S.com. And happy to meet you. I'm Drew Connery Murray. I'm on Blue Sky at Drew CM. I'm blogging at packaportraits.net. And just a note, I recently published a book, uh, if you like historical fiction, ghost stories, psychological thrillers. It's called The Haunting of Edward Drake. Uh, we're in the spooky season. So if you're looking for a spooky book, uh, you can find it on Amazon and uh, Barnes and Noble, The Haunting of Edward Drake. If you're interested, we would appreciate it if you checked it out. Uh, that does wrap up this episode of Network Break. If you enjoyed the show, please let, leave a recommendation on Apple Podcasts or share a link with a friend. And you can always send us comments, corrections, or kudos at packetpushers.net dot net slash fu we do take all follow-up seriously so please do reach out as always thanks for listening